Hey, well, good morning, C3 Church. It's so good to be with you. This is Peter Morton here from the River Christian Church and uh, obviously joining you virtually this morning. So bummed I don't get to be there in person. was really looking forward to preaching uh, to your church and uh, catching up with you guys uh, at both your, uh, your Aviemore Church and also to uh, that wonderful new church plant there in Ormiston, uh, today, but uh, you know, lockdown, uh, and here we are online. But it's still really great to to be with you, and thank you for having me. And uh, man, I just love your church, and uh, just so blessed to be able to connect with uh, Pastor Steve and Dawn. What great people, and have been really enjoying their friendship in more recent times, and loving their vision and heart for um, our area and for what God is doing in your church and through your church. And uh, obviously to uh, Pastor Wayne and Wendy, they've been long-standing friends of ours and have been a real blessing, not just to us, but to so many other pastors and leaders in uh, East Auckland and across the nation and across the world and, and love those guys. And, uh, and also too, it was really cool to catch up with um, Pastor Judy. Dickinson and uh, see the um, the great new facility there that you guys have opened up at Ormiston when we had our Ministers Association there just a few days before you guys opened and, and Judy was showing me around the building and uh, man it's just so awesome it's a beautiful beautiful facility and excited for what God is going to do in that place and through you guys as a church there. Um, now, uh, I, I know some of you guys there at C3, and I will probably be a new face for some of you. So um, I'm Peter, I'm the pastor of the River Christian Church. So we're just around the, the bend from you guys in Ben Loman Crescent. And um, we've been pastoring there for 15 years alongside my wife, Anika. I've got uh, three kids, um, Nathan, who's 21. He's getting married in a couple of months. And um, so you can just agree with us for in prayer for the, the, the levels to come down a bit so that we can have the, the wedding that we were hoping to be able to have. Um, my daughter, Analia, she is 19. She's studying occupational therapy at AUT. And uh, my youngest son is Jaden, and he's 16, and he's just learnt to he's just learning to drive at the moment. Just started that whole process, so you can pray for me there. Um, he's pretty good, though. Actually, I have to say, I also lead the East Auckland Ministers Association, uh, which connects leaders of churches in the Howick Ward and in the East Auckland area, and uh, you know, just for friendship to uh, build connections between the churches to pray together. Really believe that unity is just such an important part of God's blessing in, a, in an area. And um, so we, we're really blessed to have a great ministers association here in East Auckland. And I love this part of the city. I, was, um, I wasn't born here, but I moved here when I was six years old. And I went to Cockle Bay School and Mellons Bay Primary and Bucklers Beach Intermediate. I met my wife at McLean's College. She also, too, is an East Auckland girl. So, you know, we've been here forever. We love this part of Auckland, love what God is doing here. And uh, I grew up in a Christian home, uh, but I had a powerful encounter with God when I was 15 years old. And uh, that really completely changed my life. And it, I guess, I suppose in a lot of ways, that's a great segue into what I'm going to be talking about this morning, because I understand that you guys have been doing a, a series called The Helper, talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, what a great subject to be talking about. I think sometimes the, the Holy Spirit doesn't get the press that he really deserves. Uh, we talk a lot about the Father and the Son, but sometimes he can be, uh, I've got a friend in Whangarei who's just finished a preaching series called The Other Guy. And uh, sometimes he can be a little bit of the other guy, you know, a bit mysterious. It's like, well, who is this Holy Spirit? And how do we relate to him? And, you know, uh, I'm sure you've been talking about this, but the Holy Spirit isn't just a, a force. You know, he's not just the, what you feel. He's not just the presence of God. He is a person. And uh, Jesus himself never referred to the Holy Spirit as an it, but he always referred to the Holy Spirit as he. You know, he said he will comfort you. He will remind you. So there's definitely a personal connection there uh, in terms of a relationship. And you know, a strong relationship with the Holy Spirit is really not an optional extra for us in the Christian life. Acts 1.8 says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You know, signs, wonders, miracles, our empowerment as Christians, all of that comes from a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
And God has not called us to the natural, but to the supernatural. He's not called us to the ordinary, but to the extraordinary. And it not to be, he's not called us to what can be done with just human strength, but to what is impossible. And for all of these things, we need a strong relationship with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, like any relationship, uh, it's strengthened through time together. I mean, I'm really blessed, and I'm sure many of you guys are too, to have long-standing friends that sometimes you don't catch up with them for a while, and then you see them, and you basically kind of pick up where you left off. But the truth is, though, that relationships really grow, and they are strengthened when we are intentional about them and when we make that time for them. And so what I want to do this morning is just talk briefly about building into and growing in our relationship with God and specifically about spending regular time with Him in a quiet time or in a devotional or whatever language you want to use for it. I've actually written a book on the subject and I'll I'll talk more about that at the end. But you know what, I've been pastoring for 15 years now and I've been in full-time ministry for nearly 25 years and now clearly that's not as long as Pastor Wayne Pete, who has been in ministry longer than most of us have been alive. Um, I have it on record that he was personally mentored by Charles Finney, and I understand he went through Bible college with St. Francis of Assisi as well. So I think he's been around for a while, but I've been around a little while, and I've been around long enough to be able to see a whole lot of Christian fads kind of come and go. You know, everything from your WWJD bracelets, remember those? You know, who was John Denver? To the uh, Christian aerobics, Christian death metal, Ron Canoli, 90s Hillsong worship with the vests, the brass section and the choir. Come on. I know some of you guys still love that. You know, been there, done that, given in the offering. But, you know, if I had to put my finger today on one thing that I've really seen that is a catalyst to people's uh, kind of growth and their walk with God, what I would say is that it is a commitment to spending regular time with Him in a devotional or in a quiet time. Time and time again, you know, when I see someone who's really going to new levels in their public walk with God, time and time again, I'll find someone who's getting serious about spending regular time with Him in private. So what's happening in private always affects what's going on and what the rest of the world sees. And it's interesting for me, you know, because nearly every time I do a message or if I talk about the importance of having regular devotionals, I'll nearly always have someone who comes to me and says, but, you know, that's all well and good, Peter, but you know what? I spend time with God all day long. You know, I just talk with Him during the day while I'm driving the car, while I'm on the toilet, while I'm making dinner, while I'm doing whatever. I, I just I just cultivate a, a moment-by-moment relationship. I practice the presence of God. And, you know, do I really need to set aside specific time? Isn't that just a bit religious? Isn't that just a bit old-fashioned? You know, isn't it really just about a relationship? And, you know, what I would say is that, Look, it's so important for us to practice the presence of God and to walk with Him moment by moment. You know what? That's kind of the goal. That's, you know, <laughs> what, we, what we're aiming for. That's absolutely what we want. But at the same time, though, I really believe that if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, then we must do what Jesus did. And so we could ask ourselves the question, well, did Jesus walk and talk with the Father all day long? Well, yes, He did. Absolutely. You know, the, the Bible says that Jesus said, I, I don't do anything of myself. I only do what I see my father doing. And so he lived in that moment by moment relationship with God. But we could ask ourselves another question too. And that is, you know, did Jesus regularly withdraw to quiet places to spend time alone with God? And the answer to that is, well, yes, he did. And he didn't just do that occasionally. I mean, the gospels are full of examples of Jesus withdrawing to spend that time alone, one-on-one with God. And, you know, that's really interesting to me. Because I would say that Jesus had the best relationship with God of anyone who's ever walked the face of the earth. I mean, he was connected with the Father, not just through the presence of the Holy Spirit, not just by faith, but because he was God himself. He had a better connection with God than any of us will ever have. Everything he did, he modeled as an example for us to follow. And so it would stand to reason to me that if if it didn't matter about spending time alone with God, If you could get all that you needed by just walking and talking with him as you go about your day, then Jesus would have done just that. But he didn't. He withdrew. And he spent that time alone with God. And I would submit that if the greatest, most holy and righteous person who has ever walked the face of the earth felt it was important to withdraw, to spend time alone with God, then 
why would we think for a second that we wouldn't need it? But you know what? It doesn't also just end just there because when Jesus is talking on prayer, what does he say? He says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father. And a couple of things out of this. Firstly, he says when and not if. So, you know, he says when you pray. So he's expecting that prayer is going to be a regular part of our Christian life. But then he says something interesting. He says, go into your room and close the door. Set time apart from your busy life to come and seek me. You know, that doesn't sound like someone who's just saying, hey, look, just talk to me all day as you go about your day. That sounds like someone who's saying, hey, you know, I want to be with you every moment of the day and and talk with you and walk with you. But also, too, I want to have some moments of your undivided attention when it's just you and me. I want to have that kind of relationship with you. You know, Pastor Wayne was uh, speaking at our church a few weeks ago, and he said something really powerful. He said, we're often asking for more of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is often asking for more of us. And I was like, boom, wow, that's awesome, man. What are they putting there in the coffee at C3, man? It's, it's clearly, it's good. But, you know, there is an aspect of prayer and connection with the Father that you will only get in the secret place. And naturally, that overflows into us taking God into our everyday life and being aware of Him moment by moment. But it starts with us intentionally creating a time and a place in which to encounter God. And that's a real key for growing in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, is setting apart that time and place to regularly encounter Him. And looking through the Scripture, what we can see is that the saints of old all spent time with God in a set-apart place, regularly in different ways. You know, Jacob would go out into the fields. Peter would go up onto the roof. Daniel would open the windows in his upper room. David would head to the tabernacle. All of them found their place to encounter God. But you know, what is a little bit more hidden though is exactly what happens when we are in that place with God. Scripture is not quite as prescriptive about what we do in our devotional times as much as to have them. And it's interesting, you know, in the late 90s, I was a youth leader at a youth camp. And uh, on the Friday night, we had all of these kids rock up. And uh, a whole bunch of them had, uh, were, had never been involved in Christian things or anything before. And so on the Friday night, we preached the gospel and a whole bunch of them gave their life to the Lord. That was so awesome. And so the next morning, uh, the speaker at the camp spoke about the importance of having a devotional life. And so all of these kids were sent off with, the, you know, some of them we'd just given a new Bible to. And so they were sent off around different parts of the camp to go and spend some time with God. And uh, I remember I was standing up on one of the balconies and just watching all these kids heading off. And, and I noticed this one young guy and he went and sat down under a tree. And he obviously he'd just given his life to the Lord the night before. And I remember seeing him up there at the altar call. And, um, and he had his new Bible with him. And I watched as he sat down and he opened up his new Bible and I saw him kind of flicking through it. And it was clear he was trying to find somewhere to start, you know. Uh, and if you've read the Bible, you know it's, it's not an ordinary book. It doesn't just go from kind of beginning to end. Um, and so he was trying to find somewhere to hook into. And, and after a little while, I saw him close his Bible and then it looked like he was trying to pray. And I just, I thought, man, how awesome is this? This kid, he's just given his life to the Lord. And look, he's reading his Bible and praying. And uh, I, I turned away to do something else for a bit. And then when I looked back, uh, his head was back against the tree and his eyes were closed. And I deduced one of two things that had happened. Either he was overcome by the presence of God or more likely he had kind of just given up and was taking a bit of a nap. Anyway, I caught up with him at lunch that day and we're talking about, you know, the night before. And he's like, man, it's so amazing. Give my life to the Lord. I'm so excited. And so I asked him about that time his devotional time, he goes, oh, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit hard to get into. And, you know, I really think that sometimes, um, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to spending time with God, it's often not taught to new believers or young Christians on exactly how to do it. It's kind of almost this, you know, we'll just do it and God will show you how sort of a thing. You know, here's a Bible, read it. There's a corner, go pray and, uh, you know, you'll figure it out. And, I think sometimes it can be a little bit like, you know, throwing little babies in the deep end of the pool and wondering why they're struggling to swim. Because there's a transition that happens when we go into our devotional times and our quiet times. Because I don't know if you've noticed it, but spending time in a room by yourself is very different from spending time with God at church. Have you figured that one out? 
You know, when we come to church, there's a preacher and there's a worship band. and There's lots of other people. And, uh, you know, we're singing songs and it's pumping and the preacher brings a great message. And in a lot of ways, you know, we're kind of carried along on this current uh, with lots of other people. And uh, I mean, I love a good church service. I love that sense of being able to walk out into the week feeling 10 feet tall and bulletproof and ready to take everything on. But, you know, when you transition to your devotional time, you know, it's quieter. There's just you and God and your Bible. You know, there's no crowds of people. There's no preacher. There's no one saying, come on. It's just us and God. And we kind of walk out into that inky blackness to figure out who this God is and, and what it's like. And so it's, it really is quite a different transition. It's a completely different environment. And, uh, you know, I think it's so important that we understand that when we're coming to our devotional times and our one-on-one -on -one times with God, we have to prepare for that very different environment than what it's like for us at church. If we're going to win with that time and in that season, we've got to, and in those moments with God, we've, we've got to prepare for them. And so, uh, you know, one of the biggest things, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that we can do to prepare for that time. But I just want to talk to you about one of them this morning. And that is about dealing with distractions. Because uh, I don't know if you've found this, but I'm sure you have. If you have ever gone to say, look, I'm going to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with God and uh, have found yourself getting distracted in that time and finding it struggling hard to stay on task. Uh, you know, I, I did a survey on this particular thing, and I found that 70% of people found themselves getting, at least 70% of people found themselves getting distracted, at least in some way, while they were trying to spend time with God. And, I, you know, we've all been there, haven't we? You know, you're trying to read the Bible or something like that, and then, like, then the next moment, somehow you find yourself on social media scrolling through posts and making comments, and you're like, how did I get here? How did that happen? But you know what? It's so normal. And uh, in 1 Kings 19, the prophet Elijah comes face to face with God. And, and we read in that passage that there were three things. There was a wind, there was an earthquake, and there was a fire. And Elijah had to press through those things in order to be able to hear the voice of God. And when we come to spend time with the Holy Spirit one-on-one, -on -one, we will find too that there is a wind, there is an earthquake, and there is a fire that we will have to often overcome before we get to that place a breakthrough. Let's go through each one of these things quickly. Firstly, the wind. The wind can represent our distracted thoughts. You know, the average person has about 70,000 thoughts a day. I think that's like uh, about, um, oh, they have a lot each day. <laughs> I was going to break it down to seconds and I, I can't remember exactly how much it was. It's a lot. But one study though showed that people are generally spending at least half of their waking time thinking about something apart from what they should be doing at the time. You know, so they're supposed to be working on the Excel spreadsheet and they're thinking about their vacation or thinking about winning lotto or something else. Half of our days are generally spent thinking about something else apart from what we should be thinking about at the time. So is it any surprise that when we come to our devotional times that we're still struggling with this distracted brain? And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we understand that it's not something that God gets angry with us about if we find ourselves getting a bit distracted in our times with Him. I used to feel like I was really letting God down if I was trying to pray and then my mind got distracted. I kind of would almost feel like God was like sitting there going, well, you know, I mean, clearly I'm not first in your life. And, you know, I'd, I'd feel this burden of like continually letting Him down because my thoughts would keep getting distracted. <clears throat> but you know what? Here's the truth. God gets you. He gets you because He made you. He knows what you're like. He knows your heart. He knows the struggles that you go through. And you know what? He doesn't hold that against us. He's like the father and the prodigal son. His arms are always open. And He's always ready to welcome us back to Him every time that we, we come to Him. So, you know, if we're praying and if we get distracted in those times, don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Just gently put your thoughts back on God and keep going. It's okay. It happens to everyone. So we've got that wind, you know, that, those uh, distracting thoughts. But we've also got the earthquake. And the earthquake can represent our unsettled emotions. You know, there's actually a thing called the letdown effect, which maybe you've experienced this. You know, people who've been working really hard for a long period of time, and then they finally get a break and they go away on holiday and they get sick. Ever had that happen? Um, and it's almost like our body's like, oh, okay, you've taken a break for a bit. Um, I've, I've just got a bit of stuff to catch up on here. <laughs> you know, and then suddenly we're dealing with all this stuff. Um, it's called the letdown effect, you know. Um, 
but you know sometimes we can have almost uh, a situation like that when we get into God's presence it's like we finally stop we finally reach that place where you know like we're pushing away all the distracted thoughts and everything and then suddenly all of these emotions and all this unprocessed stuff and things that have been worrying and upsetting us or things like all of that stuff can start rising to the surface and we're, we're wanting to spend time with God and suddenly we're thinking about this person and this situation and we're upset about this or, you know. But you know what? We've been given this really powerful weapon that we can use in our devotional times too and it's called worship. Um, you know, worship isn't just singing a song. It's a doorway through which we invite the Prince of Peace to come and to live in our hearts and, um, and to bring His peace into our life. And Man, we live in this incredible day where great worship is just so easily available. You know, so I want to encourage you for your devotional times, your times with Him. You know, create some Spotify lists or, you know, some music playlists or whatever device you use of songs that really build you up, songs that really connect you with God. And have those things playing because they'll help settle your heart, they'll help settle your mind, settle your emotions so you can really enter into that place and focus on God. And so we've got the wind, the earthquake, and then the fire. And, you know, the fire can represent our anger or our bitterness. And, I mean, all of us have got stuff that we're processing in some way, shape, or form about what other people have said or done, some anger and some bitterness that's still kind of, you know, some resentfulness that's going on in our hearts. You know, and that stuff can really burn like a fire if we let it. But what we have to learn how to do is we've got to learn how to bring that stuff to God and not to hold on to it. Otherwise, it can become a blockage, not just in our lives, but also in our relationship with Him. And forgiveness really is the key there. Um, and, you know, forgiveness, I mean, we're talking a lot about vaccines at the moment, being in lockdown. But you know what? Forgiveness is not a vaccine. It's not just like, a, oh, I got the one shot. You know, I, I forgave that person once and now everything should be fine. I mean, if you've ever walked through forgiveness, you will know it is not a vaccine. It's a daily prescription. It's something that you have to keep taking every day until symptoms cease. Like you just got to keep popping that pill again and again of forgiveness. And every time that symptom starts up, you've just got to keep releasing forgiveness. I want to encourage you this morning that if, in, if you're in that process, sometimes it can feel like it's never going to go away. Like you're never, ever going to be able to ultimately forgive that person. But trust the process. Keep engaging with forgiveness and you'll find eventually that your heart will start to get better. And that fire that can become such a blockage to our times with God will also get dealt with. You know, and as we press through the wind and the earthquake and the fire, that's where we get to hearing the very voice of God. And uh, I want to encourage you in this lockdown to, uh, to start a regular habit of spending regular time in God's presence with the Holy Spirit in a devotional time. You know, some of you got a bit more time on your hands right now, and it's a great time to start, you know, just do it. Others, you know, you might be overwhelmed and overworked right now, and there are many who are in that place. Can I encourage you? That even if you just take a short period of time with God in the morning before you head out into your day, man, that's going to settle you. It's going to encourage you. It'll build you up. It'll put you on the front foot for whatever it is that you're going to encounter in the day ahead. And look, if spending time regularly with God by himself was important enough for Jesus to model it and to teach it, then how much more important is it for us too as his followers? So I've got a whole lot more that I could say on this. But for time's sake this morning, I'm just going to finish it there. But I'm just going to go also uh, tell evangelists for just a second. I'm just going to tell you about this uh, book that I've written. This book's called The God Who's Glad to See You. And it's about devotional times. And some of what I've shared this morning is expanded on in here. Um, but the whole purpose of this book is to help us see God as the God who's glad to see us. He's not the God who's angry with us because of how long it's been since we last prayed and He's more like that father with the prodigal son. His arms are always open wide. He's always overjoyed that we have come to spend time with him. So there's some practical steps in here on how to have regular devotional times. I've had lots of feedback from people who've read it. And they've said, man, thank you so much for just such a practical book. Parents have read it and given it to their teenagers and said, man, read this. It'll help you. Um, there's also teaching in here on different ways of praying and engaging with God on um, how to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and some practical steps on actually how to literally feel His presence in your devotional times, how to engage with persistent prayer, how to use the gift of tongues, how to discern the will of God for your life uh, in your devotional times. 
So I've been getting a lot of repeat orders too from people who've read it and they've given it away to someone and had to come back and buy another copy. So if you're interested in this, you can uh, head to my website, which is petermorton.wordpress.com. You'll see a link there for the book. You can read a preview for it online. You can place an order. Normally they're $30 each, but I'll make them available to you guys for this week for $25. Uh, you can follow the instructions that are there on the page and place an order there. And if you're in the local Howick ward, which includes all of you guys in Flatbush, then I'll even organize a drop-off direct to your letterbox for free. Or you can pick up a copy from our church office when we're back in whatever level we need to be in order to be able to do that. But hey, look, bless your heaps. And I trust that some of this has been helpful for you this morning and that together we can grow in our relationship with the Holy Spirit and believing that the best is yet to come for you guys and for your church. God bless and have a fantastic week.